Um, I'm going to talk about Ansible and CloudStack. I'm going to be a bit more generic, a bit more general in a lot of spaces to where uh, Billy was, just was. Um, but also, I will do a demo, but I've done too many that have gone pear-shaped to do mine live. Um, but also, my, uh, we're looking particularly at using Ansible with CloudStack as well as using it to deploy um, CloudStack. So a bit of background. Uh, so I'm a cloud architect of Shape Blue. I've worked with um, CloudStack since the kind of, basically when it was bought by Citrix in around about 2.213. So I've seen it kind of change quite a bit. Um, my, if you like, if specialty, if I have one, is uh, around actually deploying CloudStack in customer environments and then helping them with using CloudStack in their environment, uh, integrating it in with what it is they're actually trying to achieve and what they're trying to do. And you can see uh, some of the clients uh, I would normally work with. And I say, this means that when I look at CloudStack and, and stick my oil in and mailing lists and that kind of thing, uh, I'm looking at it from the point of view of what will people who are consuming CloudStack, what are they going to do with this feature, how are they going to want to use it, how they want to, what they want to get out of CloudStack. Um, and so we've got uh, some of the kind of names from a, the simplicity logo slide and our obligatory kind of just a bit about shape blue. Um, kind of what you can take from that is this is my day job. As a, you know, if some people work with CloudStack, but it's not necessarily what they do day in, day out. And it's, this is what we do day in, day out. This is how we try and uh, earn our money. So this is what, where we're going with it. So... It might have been better if this talk was before the yeah, Luke, but because um, I'm going to start a bit back at the beginning uh, of what is configuration management. Um, for some of you, this is going to be kind of uh, noddy, but for some of you, this kind of hopefully fills in some gaps because you might have heard people talking a lot from the technical side of it, but no one going back and saying, well, what, what is it we're actually, actually trying to do here? Um, and basically, I, I would kind of try and describe it as the idea of saying, uh, what state do we want a server to end up in rather than the way we used to, where we used to script to say what steps do we need to do to get to a, a state. We now just describe the state and let our configuration management tool do the rest of that for us and get it to that state and know that it shouldn't do it um, and know not to do damage if we tell it again, I want to be in that state. Uh, I'll give some examples in a se second. And the other part of it is moving away from the old-fashioned scripting, that also gives us centralization of both the actual configuration data and the actions that we take to get to that state. Um, the last line said, uh, it has to be idempotent. Uh, and then, so I had to look up exactly what idempotent, um, the definition of it is. And obviously, uh, this is probably best described in examples. So. Our first example, and I'm going to take CloudStack as an example here. Um, the first thing we have to do is make some changes to the my.conf file um, for our SQL servers. Uh, if you were using uh, just uh, some bash scripting, some shell scripting, you might do a sed command that just adds those in for you. Uh, but the problem becomes if, if during your installation something went wrong, if you try and run that again, it's going to start adding lines in again. That may not be so bad in this instance, but certainly after time, in other cases, that's, that's really not going to be good if you just keep multiplying the lines you add. So a configuration management tool is going to know that those lines need to be there, and it's going to look to see if they're there and not add them again if you don't need them. So let's say in our configuration management tool, we would just say, those lines must be in my my.conf. Um, and that's all I'm, I need to tell you about it. The other kind of things you might say is, uh, these are the service I need to be installed and running. Um, we've done, uh, these are the configuration files that I need, and I need them to contain this information. I need a, this file in that directory. Um, those kind of things where you're just going to say, that's what's gotta, what's what it's got to be like, and I'm not going to tell you how to do it because you already know and you won't break things by trying to do it. Um, and again, I'll say the centralization of your configuration and the fact that these can then be reused. So then if you've got a, a whole pool of web servers, they're, all, they're well, certainly IP addresses or whatever are going to be subtly different. But if your configuration management tells you, says you can now 
I want that configuration on all of these with the exception of you're going to be called that, you're going to be called that, and you're going to be called that. That's a lot better than going into scripts and then finding all the instances of an IP address and changing them and then running it individually. So that's just a quick uh, whistle-stop tour of sort of high-level config management. So to talk about Ansible specifically, um, from a technical point of view, uh, we don't need a client-server kind of architecture. Ansible uh, uses SSH. So as long as you have SSH and uh, it's Python 2.4 or greater uh, on the machine, it can then communicate with it and start uh, making changes and doing whatever you want. Um, you can use either directly typing a password in if you want to, if you're running one by one Ansible, um, and the demo does that, or you can have used the public private keys so that you don't need to uh, have any kind of touch at all. Um, this is, kind of makes it easier to deploy in environments, particularly kind of very new ones, as opposed to needing to bake in, for instance, uh, chef clients or whatever before you start. Um, we use the idea of modules to actually do actions. So the yum module knows about how yum works, how not to break things when it's running yum, um, how to do an update, how to do install, erase, and all that kind of thing. And they can be written in any language that's capable of returning JSON or key value pairs, which means it's very easy to add modules and that. They get added at quite a rate. Because um, to be fair, it, it is a newer technology than Chef and Puppet, so uh, a lot of these things have all been done in Chef and Puppet, but um, I think Ansible is kind of coming up on the rails there. And also, uh, from a technical point of view, it's got an API, so it's a, always, always good. From the user perspective, um, it is a much shallower learning curve to get started with Ansible than, than any of the others, and um, you don't need to so much learn a program, programming language or be particularly fluent in it to, to get it to do what you need to do. Uh, I would consider myself more as um, an op dev than a dev op. I came from the operations side and can code a bit, and I can use Ansible pretty well. I don't come from the sort of dev side and I'm moving to operations. Um, and as I say, so I've got a note at the bottom, the, if you like, ecosystem is not as mature yet. Uh, but they've launched their Ansible Galaxy, which is just is like a community for people um, uploading their playbooks for uh, others to use. So it is growing and getting momentum. Uh, so where can we use Ansible? Um, we can use it to build the RPMs from the source code. Uh, it's very capable of doing that. Uh, we can use it to deploy our infrastructure. We can use it to deploy our hosts. And obviously then we can make configuration changes to the host and management VMs and go through the patching of hosts as well. And ultimately then you can start uh, deploying and configuring the actual guest virtual machines themselves in the cloud stack um, environment. So all of these things are actually uh, things we've done with some of our clients. Um, all of those are how they do their patching, how they do the um, environment builds using Ansible. Uh, they actually have, have taken that next step where they use Ansible to read their environment file and then from, use that to build a cloud monkey script which will then install the hosts, pods, clusters. So the Ansible environment file holds all that information uh, and Ansible then builds a cloud monkey script which it then runs to then actually do that next step as well. So on using Ansible, uh, we have the idea of host inventories, uh, like Jeff and the others. We've got roles. We can also um, create tasks. Thank you. Um, and we have some variables which we'll, we'll tie to either hosts or groups, say web servers or um, uh, app servers. We have these modules, as I say. We've got a load of built-in ones, but it is uh, easy enough to write your own. Uh, and then we use templates which use the um, Jinja 2 templating model. So it's not a kind of reinvented thing. It's, it's already using a standard type of templating. So uh, you do the same stuff as you use Jinja 2 to then uh, use your templates and with, in conjunction with variables, 
Uh, you can loop through all of your hosts to add sections into a config file, for instance. All that kind of stuff you can do with um, uh, the Jinja 2. And finally, then we have the playbooks, which bring those all together, really. They, they, it takes it from American football terminology of having plays. Uh, installing Ansible keeps changing a little bit, but generally it's pretty easy to just quickly install Ansible. It's no big deal. Um, what we kind of tend to do, in fact, go on to the next slide, um, to install Ansible, we actually we've turned this around a bit. We actually do a git pull of our repo that's got all the Ansible information in it, um, which also has just scripting for installing Ansible as well. So then you just run that, and then the whole thing just comes together. So you don't have anything installed to start off with other than uh, Git, really, to then build an Ansible server. And the way Ansible works, you can have multiple of these. So you don't have one server as long as the, um, your repository of playbooks is being, that's what you get, being kind of source managed. Um, you can then just create as many of these servers as you want to feed whatever kind of size of infrastructure you're going for. Uh, in terms of RPMs from source, I'm not going to uh, go through that at the moment, but David Nally has written a, a blog on how to do that. Um, he got excited about Ansible uh, and was looking for ways he could streamline building RPMs. So um, he's done a blog on, on uh, his learning curve of doing that and things he found out from doing it. So using uh, Cloud, Ansible with CloudStack. Uh, thank you. We've got, uh, we can create and deploy uh, our Ansible server environment to start off with. And then we can use Ansible to create our guest VMs. We could use uh, Cloud Monkey with CloudStack and Ansible modules to then uh, create our instances. Uh, that's, people are working on that and trying to kind of make that a bit more uh, slick. Uh, and also we've got the EC2 module. Now given you can then fire up the Amazon API compatibility, if you like, in, in CloudStack, you can then just use the EC2 um, module to make those commands to start a virtual machine. So it's kind of already there without having to do anything. Um, in terms of how we'd configure guest VMs, uh, we can use dynamic inventories to know what we've got, and I'll, on the next slide we'll talk about that a bit. Uh, in the pay for version of Ansible, I think it's Tower, uh, it has a, a module called callback where it will sit and poll and wait for the virtual machine, basically the, well, there's various uses for it, but in this case, it will wait for the virtual machine, which you've started to basically come alive before carrying on with the rest of um, the commands you need. Um, and we would then use roles, which you'll see uh, some of those in a minute. Um, but also, we could inject our user data into the virtual machines to tell them what, what kind of virtual machine they're going to be. And then use Ansible pull, which would then um, pull in from a central repository or one of your central repositories of playbooks what it needs to do to be that virtual machine. So you can kind of reverse it around and use Ansible pull from the client and get what it's going to do. And then use that in conjunction with your user data to tell the machine you've just um, started what, what it's got to go look for. Um, and again, if we're going to maintain guest virtual machines, we would probably use uh, the dynamic inventories in conjunction with uh, playbooks. And we'll get examples of those in a minute. So a useful thing uh, Ansible has is this idea of a dynamic inventory where it can go and basically poll and find out what you've got, what's in your environment. Um, there is now one for CloudStack, which was written by Sebastian. Uh, and then you have... Ooh, a whole number of other ones um, which uh, Ansible can use to then find out what, what's in your environment to orchestrate it then. Um, and then the version, the pay for one, is capable of maintaining a database of that if, if you need it to. Uh, but our open source version that we generally play with uh, doesn't. Uh, and then kind of a a reminder that obviously something is going to be telling Ansible what to do. It's either a person or some kind of tooling. Ansible isn't just going to start creating virtual machines because you thought you might need one. You've got to remember this isn't the 
uh, telepathic silver bullet. It's just it's very good at what it does. It's good for automation as well as um, configuration management. But you have to remember that you're going to have to make some decisions somewhere or have tooling that's going to make decisions for you somewhere. So to move on to uh, actually deploying CloudStat um, management server. Now I've um, shortened some of it. I haven't gone into uh, added some of the extra uh, creating an NFS server, that kind of thing. This was um, something I did as a more as a tutorial. So we have the initial, uh, our normal cloud stack rollout, which would be multiple management servers, uh, multiple MySQL servers, one being master, one being slave, a pair of um, HA proxy load balances in um, failover. So when I was asked to do something for a community, I sort of had to pair it all back to make it kind of more manageable. So this is just doing some parts of it. Um, and it's actually in the cloud stack documentation. If you go and look in the cloud stack documentation, there's a section on, on Ansible, uh, and that was what that was based on this. Um, so you're going to have some um, prereqs, and, uh, and then I'm going to take you through creating the roles, the templates, the tasks, and finally the playbook, and then do the demo, which, uh, as I recorded it, I hope it still works this time. So my prerequisites for this, where the base I started from to be able to do the demo, was a CentOS 6.4 host, um, two of them. One that I was going to have as my Ansible server, and one of them that I was going to uh, install CloudStack on. I had already uh, signed in my hosts, um, or the hosts that I'm using already have IP addresses, uh, so I already knew what I was going to be creating, and a sort of DNS and that kind of thing, and internet connectivity was already there. So I, I kind of started off with just a I wasn't trying to hold time myself too much in terms of what I was trying to build. Uh, in terms of the cloud stack management server, I was going to need to do some very similar steps. I was going to need to create a MySQL role, a cloud stack role, uh, a database deployment task, uh, a seeding secondary storage task, which I've skipped for the purposes of the video because it takes too long to sit and watch, uh, and it's really dull. And then um, and then I'll create a playbook that pulls all of those together. Uh, I think, hopefully, that's just about big enough. Uh, I'd recommend if you want to look at these, you either look at the uh, CloudStack documentation, uh, the, the read the docs site has the, all of this on there, uh, or my slide deck will be available as well, so you can look at them in depth. Um, but basically, uh, we're doing things like just saying, ensuring MySQL server is installed, and uh, I'm having yum do that, so it's yum, uh, MySQL dash server state is present. Um, same with the MySQL Python, because, I, I, um, because Ansible is using Python to control things, I need the Python bindings in there to do things. Uh, I need to be able to control SE Linux as well, because that's in there. Um, there are multiple ways. I did, it, did, did this in a particular way to demonstrate particular um, features. What another way of adding these lines into the file would actually to be have a have a template of the file and tell CloudStack put that template in. Uh, that would overall give you probably more control. Uh, but um, for the uh, idea of showing how you can have uh, an item and then loop through these items rather than having to write multiple lines out, um, it was a sort of more of a demonstration of that. So here we say, with these items, add, the, add them as a line into this file. And then it loops through all of those and does it for you. Um, it also has a MySQL module already. So I can uh, just send commands uh, about the MySQL user and configure that to set a password. The cl cloud stack management role. I've got, uh, similarly, I've got to get SE Linux Python bindings in there so that I can control it. Um, here, you have the CloudStack repo, and I'm using a, uh, a Jinja2 template there that I'm going to then put in and define where my repo is. Um, I've got, say, here, Yum has to then have the CloudStack management, state, uh, management service as present, and I've got to get URL, so I'm going to say, that that URL or that file from that URL has got to be present in that location as well. 
So in terms of like Jinja 2 templating, here you can see I've said uh, the standard uh, repo kind of file you'd see, but I've got the base URL for CloudStack as a variable, which enables me then to have different environments where I use exactly the same playbook, but I just change that variable at a higher level, and then I deploy, and I can switch between creating different types of CloudStack um, server, or as we go along doing deployments, Obviously, as CloudStack service, the uh, CloudStack version increases, then we just change that. The database deployment task, uh, example of using uh, a command module, which is just sell it, sending uh, a usual kind of bash command, shell command to the um, whatever the host is that we're running on. Uh, there's an alternative, which is the shell command, and that will um, use environment properties that you've got. So if you set an environment variable, if you use command, uh, Ansible will ignore that. If you use shell, then Ansible will take into account any environment uh, variables that exist on the host. Seeding secondary storage uh, obviously takes a long time, particularly if you're doing all of the different um, hypervisor types, uh, we check that, make sure it's mounted, and then run through those. So say I've kind of skipped that step in terms of the de actual running of the demo, because uh, it's very dull and long. And so finally, we have um, the playbook. So uh, in terms of this um, example I did, I brought all the variables into the playbook. Uh, but you have host vars and group vars as separate files, which you can then, um, uh, if you like, or inventories in YAML, which you can then call as part of your playbook um, running. Uh, to make this simpler, I've included these in here, but you could take them out uh, and have tell CloudStack you're doing one environment, and it will look in the environment file for that and get these, or to just say playbook, dash i and a different inventory and it will do things differently or to different hosts or to different variables depending on how you've configured it. Um, so I've set up these variables if you like to start off with including the one we highlighted, the base URL. Uh, we've told it the roles that I want to have on this particular host are going to be MySQL and CloudStack Manager and then there's some tasks where I want it to uh, include the setting up the DB task and the seeding secondary storage task. Um, how are we doing for time? So, um, now for the demonstration, which is that's probably a bit small, so I do have... Oh. Which way is it? Here's me just checking that uh, on this host that I'm going to work with, uh, that the cloud stack isn't already there. Do a refresh on that to make sure. No, I haven't got any cloud stack in etc. Cloud stack isn't, isn't installed. I'm not cheating. Uh, go to the cloud stack directory or where I've got all my playbooks basically. Then until it, I want to run that. So the dash v it just means verbose. The dash K means I want to give you the SSH password. Uh, if you drop the dash K, it will assume you're using um, pairs, uh, key pairs, and, uh, and just try and do that and then generally fail, unless you've already configured that. So it's going to the other host, getting the facts from it, which are things like this um, IP address and all sorts. You can see we're now installing installed the cloud, uh, MySQL, the Python bindings is changed that file to add the uh, lines in. Has it gone off the bottom? It'll jump. There we go. So this is in verbose, so you're getting a little bit more information than you may have if you just run it separately. We've created our repo, repo file, and now it's installed in CloudStack packages. Fortunately, I put these local to make it quicker.
quicker. Yeah. And now it's copying the VHD util. It's running the cloud stack set up databases. Uh, that was done. So I go to my Firefox. I'd already tried to connect to make sure it was, there was nothing there. There we are logging in. I think there is me forgetting the password. I think it stopped. No. So, uh, how are we doing for time? Things like that. Sorry? Ten minutes. Oh, cool. Ten. So, uh, I talked about uh, Zen uh, being able to do patching of hosts. Um, Zen servers, potentially a little bit more fraught than a lot of other things using configuration management tools. Um, but we worked around it, and we worked around it using. Um, Ansible facts. I really like Ansible facts. Basically, you write uh, a small file uh, in any language you like, uh, pretty much, that can work, run on the client. So whatever the host machine is, whatever the client is, if, if you've got the language installed or running on there, then you can write your module in that language, as long as the output comes back in um, valid JSON. So it enabled us to write, write um, this fact. Uh, which was a pretty nasty bit of bash scripting that I did quick. Um, but basically what it's going to do is return to me um, a Zen server version, Zen server patches installed, was, sorry, the Zen server patches uploaded and then whether they're installed or not. So it'll run through and it'll give me a whole load of facts back um, about what's there. Uh, believe it or not, that, that is that it does run in production on a pretty large cloud, one of our clients. Um, what's, so then this is the kind of JSON that you'd get back from that, where it's telling you the version of Zen server, so I can apply the right patches, and what patches are uploaded or installed. And that's coming back from Ansible. So then I can start sending my configuration management off to go and do things based on that information. Um, Create some uh, these. So I said about you can separate out your, your variables. So you don't have to put them all in the playbook. You could set them out as kind of global. So uh, here you can see normally we would put our base URL separately outside of that uh, file. Um, also, if we've got a package server somewhere we're picking stuff up from, you can name that there. And here where we've got secondary storage servers, uh, there in there as well to give you an idea what that looks like in YAML. And here, what I've got is my hot fixes. Uh, so I'm basically giving them so I can get the name or the version of Zen server and then the hot fixes that were available at the time. So you can tell from those hot fixes it dates it to kind of summer last year. Um, now, in our hosts file, we can, we can start off with just uh, FQDNs if we like, but we can also add in an awful lot more information. So, uh, when we're building whole environments, we create a Pixie server. And then we want to uh, create all of the uh, Pixie configuration files. So we pick up things like the MAC addresses. And we loop through all of the hosts to create all the individual um, uh, Pixie config files that we need. So Ansible does all that just by reading that, having a template of what they're going to look like, and then feeding in uh, all the information that they're going to need afterwards. So again, so doing an update on a Zen server using Ansible and that, ho answer, um, that those Ansible facts about the Zen server. My first action is to get what those facts are, to get it to go and have a look on each host as it runs through them and recover those facts. Then uh, basically with the hot fixes, so I've got that list of hot fixes that relate to that version, I'm going to go check, I'm going to copy over those files, and if they're there already, it's not going to do it again. So that's the idea of configuration management. If they're not, then it's going to copy them as they're required. 
So it's comparing that list of hotfixes I said were either installed or uh, uploaded or installed against the list I had in my variable file of the ones I actually want on there. Uh, and if there are the source package tar zip file that needs to go with it, it's going to take those and copy them over as well. Uh, and then we do the, the uploading. Uh, and then because the, kind of the way it works with pools, we actually tell it to go and get the facts again to make sure, because uh, you can upload your patch to the pool master, and then it becomes available to the others as well, so you don't have to keep um, uploading it necessarily, depending on how you're doing your update. And then finally, we start applying these and uh, actually applying those patches to those hosts where we've said they need to be done. So um, we, we actually run that, or our client runs that in production to patch their Zen servers. Uh, so do I have any questions on all that? Yeah, yeah. use uh, Ansible? No, no. Okay. It, it uses Python, but you don't need to know anything about Python. I guess you, then. you need to know Python if you need to develop some uh, recipe. Uh, if you're going to develop your own module, uh, okay. then you probably would, but there's a pretty big list and growing already. Um, yeah, with the Galaxy uh, site? Yeah, so when you okay. start doing that kind of stuff, it gets more complicated. But otherwise, no, unless you actually need to develop your own module for something that hasn't been covered already. Um, you don't need to know anything about Python at all. You really just need to know um, YAML, or just at least understand it, and, and, and the Ginger 2 kind of templating, and the rest of it is understanding what it is yeah. you want. OK, so the slides, slides will be up. Um, I'm Claudia Angus, if anyone wants to follow anything, <laughs> still, want, still wants to follow anything I have to say. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you, Paul.